We're good to go now? Good afternoon. Um, as you saw, things sometimes don't work out too smoothly on putting these presentations together. What made it worse was Saturday night when I went to go back to the presentation just to kind of do an overview and kind of rehearse it because I'm creating it on the fly. Uh, I couldn't find it. It got lost in cyberspace someplace. So I immediately you know, uh, sent an email to Kimberly. I said, where did it go? Do you have any idea? And she goes, I have no idea. So I had to recreate it you know, last night. So some slides, I'm just realizing now that I didn't have in, but I'll go over those you know, as I come by. So what I'm going to talk about though is, most importantly is, and also, I got myself one of those laser lights that work for about four seconds and the batteries died. So we'll just add that to today's event. But I found the pointer, so I'm okay. Uh, so <clears throat> what I talk about mostly is windows. A lot of people truly believe that the first thing you should do to make your house more energy efficient is replace your windows. And the building science over the years has been saying your return on investment really isn't worth it. There's a lot of other things that you should be doing first. And windows, unless they're really broken and falling apart, you may not necessarily have to replace them. And I'll go through some uh, slides on the numbers on how that works. Uh, skylights, the reason I put that in there too is uh, how to get light into the dark areas of your house. You can get it into your pantry, you can get it into the bathroom, you can get it into the areas of the house that don't have natural light. And I'll show how you're able to do that and that'll help reduce the electricity. And then, since we're talking about lights and such, I have a slide here on light bulbs. You know, we've heard of uh, CFLs, incandescents, you know, um, the LED bulbs. You know, we're confused. Which one is better? Which one should we be going with? So I got a, another slide on that that'll be going into the details of, you know, the different cost of the bulbs, the life expectancy of the bulbs, and over the lifetime, you know, of the house, how much money it's going to cost you or save you to purchase certain bulbs and such. So we'll just move along. And again, I apologize for the, the you know, as far as what I was going to say, as far as the clarity of the presentation. It looks great on my slide. So if everybody wants to come sit here, you can. Um, you've all seen windows like this. You know, the first reaction is, we got to get rid of these windows. We got to change them. Um, what happens with a window is when you stand in front of it in the winter and you feel cold, it's not necessary that, necessarily that the window itself is defective. What happens is two things. One is your body heat is 98 plus degrees. That window could be 30 degrees, 40 degrees, depending on outside temperature. So what happens is you're feeling that radiant heat from your body going to the window. So you feel chilled. It has nothing to do with the window. Even your best of windows will make you feel you know, chilled like that. The other thing, important part about a window is where is the draft coming from? If there is in fact a draft, you know, you put the plastic over it in the winter time and that thing bellows out, you know, where is that draft coming from? We'll talk about that. It's, a lot of it is not necessarily the window. Lots of activity going on. So the question we're going to talk about in this first part is, do you replace them? You know, and if you've seen guys you know, any contractor wearing hard hats, you know, they're not from New England. So. But OSHA requires it, and not for residential homes. Uh, so the question we're going to go into is, you know, replacing the windows, you know, is it worth it, you know, cost-wise. The infrared picture, you know, really shows a lot. The blue is cold. The green is not as, you know, cold. Once you start getting into the yellows and the red, that's showing heat loss. So when you go through the building, and you're seeing that majority of the heat loss is, in fact, through your windows. You know, your walls themselves can be R11, can be R20, can be R30. But the windows themselves, even the best windows, are only going to be R3. So when you have such a dramatic difference, this is what you're going to see. So it's not necessarily saying that the windows are poor quality. It's saying that you got a much greater heat loss through those windows than you do through the walls themselves. 
So when you first look at that, you kind of get freaked out, but it's not as bad as it looks. And I'll show you where and how that, that where that loss comes from. First, understand the the industry. We have you know you understand our values. You know you got that's the resistance of the heat through the wall. So the higher the R value, the greater the insulation value is of that wall. Well, the industry said, well that's too. We can't let the people know that an R value of the window was only two or three because then you'll get really discouraged. So what they said is, well, let's divide it into number one and we come up with a decimal and we'll call it a U-value. I'm not positive if that's their logic, but you can add, you, you, it, mathematically, there's a difference between R and U as far as adding them up. But what happens here is that the lower the U-value, the better the quality of the window. So when you go out to buy windows and they say they're low E, argon filled, titanium coated, um, you know, kryptonite in there. That's all, it, it, it increases the efficiency of the window, but it doesn't really tell you how energy efficient the window is. What happens with a window is when the sun's out, you got sunlight is long wavelengths. And those long wavelengths are allowed to enter the house through the window. What happens is that long wavelength hits the objects in the room, the floor, the furniture, yourself, and it converts that sunlight to heat. Heat then is a short wavelength, and that short wavelength, heat tries to go to cold. So the heat in that short wavelength is trying to get out the windows again. Where you put that argon fill, where you put that titanium and all that the kryptonite, that's made to reflect heat back into the house. So it's made to allow the long wavelengths in and stop the short wavelengths from exiting. So that's basically how the window works. Um, to give you an idea, as I start out here, you know, a new value of 1.10, a lot of these single pane windows, that's the U value of the window. To give you an idea, uh, a lot of the builder grade windows, when a builder builds subdivision houses or spec houses, um, they'll put in windows that are like 0 0.60, 0 0.65. Uh, I found a lot of windows over on the uh, east side here that people bought and never installed that were like 0.65 uh, U-value. Energy Star homes, to meet that energy efficiency level, it's got to be 0.35. So it's substantially, it's like 100% better than the basic windows. The U.S. market, Peller, Anderson, Marvin, Harvey Windows, we were getting you know, like 0 0.32, 0 0.35 just to meet the Energy Star quality. Homes out of Canada can get down as low as 0.18. And now a lot of the U.S. manufacturers are starting to build homes that are in the 0 0.25, 2 point range. The reason I'm kind of showing you this is that when you talk about improving you know, the quality of your windows and you want to buy windows replacement, you ask the salesperson, not <coughs> are they energy efficient, but you ask the salesperson, what is the U value of the window? You know, and then there's other performances of a window, but that primarily will tell you what the energy efficiency is of the window. And it's a sticker right on the window. It gives you the U value of the window, but it also gives you the solar heat gate. That primarily is something that's used down in the south, southwest, where they're trying to block the sun from coming in the house. Whereas up here in the north, northeast, we want the sun to come in the house. So the other area on replacement of a window is the, well, I'm sorry, the, to improve the efficiency of a window is really the trim around the window itself. What happens is that there's a cavity on either side of the windows. A lot of the old windows that have weights in them, your cavity is maybe like three, four inches wide by the depth of the window. So it's like a four by four uh, area that's just open to the cold. It allows the breeze and the wind to come through. So those type of houses, you know, by stopping the air coming in around the trim is an obvious one. But it's not so obvious is on the homes that are new constructed, you know, even within the last five, 10 years. Fiberglass insulation is a filter. So when the builder puts in the windows and he fills in insulation in that we call that rough opening, it's the edge around the window, he fills it in with fiberglass. 
If they make it too tight, it's useless. If they make it too loose, like cotton candy, it's useless. So what you need to do on those type of windows is if it's new construction, they use spray foam in it. It seals it, it insulates it. If you're living, if your home has, you know, you want to replace your windows, you want to make sure that they remove the trim and they fill up the cavity of the trim, because usually the trim stays, and they're just removing the sashes. They're not doing anything to prevent where that air is coming in from. They're just replacing the prettiness of the window. So you want to make sure that that trim, you know, is, is clear on that. Also, as far as efficiency on windows, a, a fixed glass, that being a window that can't open, like the, the right side of the slider that's fixed, that's the most energy efficient. Then what happens is your uh, next energy efficient window is your, um, the next energy efficient window uh, is your, um, your window, your casement window. And that's a window that cranks, you know, in and out. So with that, you're able to, you know, really lock it down. Starting to get into the energy inefficient windows is more of this type of window. It works great because you're able to tilt it in and wash it. But for the rest of the year, you're losing heat out of it because the fact that it has to be loose enough to tilt means that you're gonna have a lot of air gaps you know, around the window. Plus the double hung window or sliding door has to slide by each other. So inherently, you're gonna have a gap there. You're gonna have some space. So if the house allows it, the design allows it, you know, a casement window is more energy efficient than this type of window, double hung, and then also um, the slide-by windows. Those are those small windows that slide by. Same thing as a sliding glass door. Once you slide that across, you have that gap in between it. Like your sliding door, you feel that wind that comes in between those panes and such. So you want to make sure when you, you're replacing it that you try to replace it with something more efficient than that. Okay, we'll go into some of the, the numbers here, and like I said, you're not going to read that. You know, I, I can't even read it, but I'm glad I came prepared. So, what we have here, I'm going to have to read my notes on that. This is comparing, you know, do you change your windows? What is the value of changing your windows? And this is a document that, that I didn't put together, but a professional engineer did and such. So what we have existing here in an existing house is a single pane window and it has a U value of 1.10. So that's typical to a lot of the houses that we have here. So the ways to improve the windows is A, you just simply put a storm door, a storm window over it. B, you know, you trim around it with the storm panel. Other method to do it is you replace the window, you know, with a double pane window basic quality you know, type of window. And then the third way is double pane, a low E, a high performance window. And the last one is you replace it with a, uh, a high performance window with a stone panel on it. So going over the numbers that you can't read. Uh, the first one here is a stone panel putting it over a regular window. Stone panel costs $50. The U value of the existing window is 0.50. So it's not great, but it's not you know, that bad. Well, the compromise, the window in the storm panel makes it 0.50 you know, type window. The BTUs, or energy, British thermal units that you will save by putting a storm panel on the window is 722,219 BTUs a year, which doesn't mean anything especially when you say it saves $13.20 a year. But your payback is four and a half years, 4.5 years, and you're not throwing anything in the dump. You're not throwing anything away. The second process here is you buy yourself an okay quality window, one that has a U value of a combination of 0.58, and you're paying uh, $450 for the window, you know, labor and material, install it, all that. The BTUs you're saving, surprisingly, is only 25,922. It's like it's, a third, it's quite a substantial, you know, drop in that. 
The money you're saving is eleven dollars and seven cents, you know, per year. So it's even less money. And when you do your payback, your payback is forty and a half years. So by replacing the window, your payback is way out there. So that's just for the basic quality. Window. If you put in a high performance window, you know, the low E, argon filled, and such, your cost is five hundred and fifty dollars. The U value is 0.35, so you're now in that energy star range. You now qualifies as an energy star one. And it shows your saving is 902,000 BTUs. So you've really gone up in the savings. And the dollars that you save goes $16.10. So you're only improving it by $3. And your payback is 34 years. So it's less than the 40 years, but nowhere near that four and a half years. The last one here basically is what you've done, and again, these two you need to, you're putting them in the dump. So you're throwing away what's there. Uh, this one here, you're also throwing away what's there, but what you're doing is you're putting in a, uh, a low E window, but you're adding a storm panel to it. So you're doing the best that you possibly can. The U value again is 0.35, so you're qualifying for the programs. But the BTUs you're saving is only 132,000 BTUs. And the money you're saving is only $2.29. And this is per window, per year. Your payback is 240 years on that. So what they're trying to show here, basically, is that replacing a window is not going to give you back you know, the payback you know, that you believe that you're going to get. What happens is that it's by insulating around the trim of the window is going to give you more of a payback than just simply you know, running out and replacing them. And there's ways, if you have the old type that have weights in them, too, is what we do is you remove the trim. In fact, you can do this with any house, is you remove the trim. And for most houses, you just spray foam, non-expanding foam, so it doesn't you know, uh, lock up your windows and you can never open them again. Then they become very efficient. Um, you put the, uh, with the weight, you, we put rigid insulation in there, so the weight is still able to go up and down, and then we spray foam the rest of that window, and then you put the trim back on. For existing homes, what you do is you take the trim off, and depending on the builder, you can make that what's called a rough opening, and that's that space that's between, you know, the window and the frame of the house. It can be as tight as a 32nd of an inch, it could be as wide as three, four inches. Just depends on his quality control. So, but that's where you're going to get a major part of your your uh, drafts and your heat losses coming through. You know those windows there. Any question on this before I go to the next slide? So windows. You have a question? No, I said wow. All right. Another way of bringing light into the house, and this is you can't really see it, but right up there is what's called a solar tube. Skylights are great and we've been putting them in for years. Problem with a skylight is that your attic is, could be R49, could be R30, whatever, but the skylight is still only, it's a window, so it's still only R3. So you've cut this hole in your well-insulated attic, you know, and you got, if it's on the south side of the house, you get a substantial amount of heat gain through that window. Uh, I've seen houses where they put the skylights in the kitchen and you bake, you know, or one of them I saw was over the refrigerator and the refrigerator just constantly ran, never stopped because that sunlight produces, that skylight allows so much heat to come into the building. So if you're going to do skylights, you want to be really careful about where you put them. They're great because, especially if they operate, because then you're able to vent the house, you know, especially if, you know, at night you open up that and you open up your lower windows especially if you live in a safe neighborhood, you don't mind. And then you're allowing, you know, the air to come in and nobody else, you know, to come in. So solar tubes, what they are is, it's a really, it's a neat invention. And this, oh, I'm sorry. So this is, so in case you didn't know what skylights look like. And this is the only picture I can find with skylights. <laughs> uh, that's, or is the woman, you know, dancing. But we all know what the skylights look like. And the other problem with skylights, too, is that you know how you get condensation on your windows down in those corners? Well, that's because a family of four 
produces 40 gallons of moisture per month inside that house. That moisture's got to go somewhere. Moisture is carried with the heat. The warmer it is, the more moisture it can carry. So as that moisture is going to cold, which is your basement, your walls, you know, or your skylights, how the moisture forms on the skylights, and that's where you see the staining. So your skylights are not leaking, but you are getting moisture up there that's staining the wood and could eventually rock the wood too. So, so with skylights, you want to be careful you know, of that. Looks nice and clear here. All right, a solar tube, and that's spelled correctly, is it's been around 15 years that I know of. I put it in my house when I lived down in Chester. I had a, a hallway, and I didn't have, um, you know, windows or anything like that. So we put in the solar tube, and you're only talking a 10-inch diameter or a 14-inch diameter hole. And on the roof part, you just got this little dome that sticks up about this much. But what this is, is this is all a highly reflective material. And so you're able to get sunlight down here, and it reflects off of here. There's been uh, a case that I read about in Home Builder Magazine that some woman, a family bought a house, and uh, it had these solar tubes in it, and they couldn't figure out during the day how to turn off the light. <laughs> and it was, it's, it was just sunlight. You know, they've never seen it before in the building. You know, that friend of theirs never saw it. So these things now come with, you know, it gives you incredible natural light, you know, during the day, you know, brighter than that area down there and such. You can also get it with light bulbs inside it. So at night, it doubles as a fixture. And for a little extra money, in a bathroom, you can also get it and it's vented. So it's double line. So you're able to vent your bathroom and you're getting a lot of natural light you know, coming into your bathroom. And what's nice about it too is that, I mean, this pipe isn't insulated, so you do have to worry about compensation, but in your attic, you really want to, you know, make sure that your insulation level for the rest of the attic is equal, that this is equal to that. Because you're getting moisture that still goes up into that tube, and when that moisture hits the outside here, up here, uh, and your attic is really cold, it will condense. So by putting that insulation on that lower level, you know, prevents that you know, and such. So the solar tubes, we put them a lot in, in interior bathrooms. Yes? So I've never heard of this before, so just to make sure I'm understanding what you do, you have a little thing on top. It, it's almost like a solar panel in a sense? No. It's like a skylight. You just let the light in, and yeah. the tube just kind of the tube, you bring the tube, what happens is, you know, your, your, your roof is here and your floor is here. So this tube up here is 10 or 14 inch diameter. It only sits up about this high. And then this here directs it down to the room you want. And it can go down, you know, like a full story. Wow. And it just, it's, if you look on uh, online, solar tube, um, there was one person I know of that was selling it here in New Hampshire. And I've used them, like I said, a good 15 years ago. And they're excellent. They never leaked, you know, at all. And, you know, you don't, you don't get any heat from them at all. You just get a lot of light from them. And they could be retail, could be three, four hundred dollars, you know, for it. So that's, you know, uh, the use of the solar tube. All right, the last uh, slide that I got is talking about light bulbs. And this is another one. I can read this one here. It's comparing uh, the incandescent light bulb to the CFL light bulb to the new LED light bulbs. Um, talking about here the lifespan, the watts, the cost per bulb, how much kilowatts you use, the cost of electricity is 20 cents per kilowatt. So that's high, but it's all across the board. Um, they're assuming 50,000 hours of use, you know, for it, and equivalent 50,000 hour bulb of expense, and then the total cost for the light bulb. So if you look at the LED lights, they work for 50,000 hours. The CFLs are 10,000 hours, and the incandescent ones we use mostly now are 1,200 hours. So assuming that 
you know, you need to change it and such to, to achieve that same amount of hours. So watts for the LED is only six, CFLs at 14, and the incandescent are 60 watts. You know, we've, we've known that, we've compared it to the CFLs. And uh, so we realize, you know, the savings there. The cost for bulbs, the incandescent is about 25, CFLs are 395, and the LEDs are like almost $36. So you look at it and say, I ain't buying an LED light bulb. So what you want to do then is look further down the line is the amount of wattage that it uses for kilowatts. The LED only uses 300 over that 50,000 hours. The CFLs use 700, and the incandescent use 3,000 watts over the life you know, of the bulb. So then with the cost of electricity, that incandescent is $600 to run, CFLs are 140, and the LEDs are only $60. So it's that upfront cost that's going to bite you, but then over the cost and life of the light bulb, you're saving money. Plus the fact, the person that's got to get up there and change those light bulbs. You know, we're not even factoring in what that takes. So kind of looking at it, over the life of the, the, uh, the life of the bulb, the uh, equivalent expenses here, like I said, 36. Uh, the total cost is $96 for the LED, $159 for the CFLs, and $652 for the incandescent you know, lights. So that's your, your cost over that whole lifetime. What it comes down to is for 30 light bulbs, which is an average house, the LEDs are like 2,400, like 20, 2,300. The CFLs are almost 4,000. And the incandescent is over $16,000 over the life of 30 light bulbs in a house over that 50,000 hours you know, period of time. So the savings is zero in incandescent, 12,000 in CFLs, and over 13,000. I was just going to do this. Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't going to work, but I was smart enough to stop myself. Uh, over $13,000. So when you're looking at buying light bulbs, think about not only the initial cost of it, but what it's going to be over the lifetime. Right. right now, I think in the uh, Congress is shot down. They were going to not outlaw, but basically outlaw use of incandescent lights. And I guess there was enough pushback from the public that they don't want that to happen because not everybody's happy with the CFLs and the LEDs are too expensive at this point in time. So you got anything that you know of on this? Not to put you on the spot, but yeah, don't tell me what the oh. Right. Uh, I know that, that's right. Really, um, one of the interesting questions on that is the, the power up demand that all light bulbs have. And I remember um, I think Gil Richardson said that for rooms that you're only going to be in for, you know, 30 seconds, like, you know, a closet or, mm -hmm. you know, something like that, that, you know, CFLs take as much power for, you know, just to light up as just to start up. the whole 15 seconds, but maybe that's the same for all. It's, I think it would, what I heard was that if the bulb was over two minutes, you know, on, you know, less than two minutes, the incandescent were more efficient because the CFLs, by the time they came up to speed or power, you were turning them off. Unless you got three daughters like I do. You know, I come home and my house is a glow. It's like, do you think a robber's not going to come into the house if it's brightly lit? <laughs> and, so. and people are seeing LED prices just... Right, LEDs are starting to come down. The other item, too, is with the CFLs, is the CFL fixtures. You know, that's, it's a CFL fixture, it's a pin base fixture. So the problem there is, you know, buying new bulbs. Yes? Do you know the bulbs that um, you screw in, but have a little... Uh, Curly cube? Yeah, which one is that? Is that those are CFLs. Well, those are CFLs. Those are the, okay. the LEDs are real small bulbs. LEDs are great for your Christmas tree and Christmas lights. You know, they really work extremely well in that application. Any other questions on this? Well, today was kind of short and sweet, especially with all our problems.
But my, uh, again, we have Kimberly and I. Thank you. Yes, please. I wanted to ask a question now. I wanted to let you get through your presentation. Okay, go for it. <laughs>